So welcome and good evening. My name is Libby Bischoff and as executive director, it is my pleasure to welcome you all virtually to the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education at the University of Southern Maine here in Portland. I know we have folks joining us this evening from across multiple states, regions, time zones, and even countries. And we are exceedingly grateful for you spending part of your evening with us to learn from Dr. Andrea Roberts about the Texas Freedom Colonies Project and Atlas. We are so lucky to have her with us this evening, zooming in all the way from Texas. This evening, Dr. Roberts will speak about her project for 45 to 50 minutes. And then my colleague, Dr. Paula Gerstenblatt, Associate Professor of Social Work here at USM, will moderate the Q&A. As this is a Zoom webinar, a little bit different from a Zoom meeting that many of us live our entire lives on, um, in order to participate in the Q&A, everyone stays muted, both their microphones and their, um, their video, the whole meeting. But if you have a question that you would like to ask um, and you would like us to address at the end of the presentation, please type your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And you can do that at any time and we'll remind you that at the end as well. Um, we will get to as many questions as we can um, after Dr. Roberts finishes presenting until we reach our time limit. In just a few moments, I'll formally introduce and welcome Dr. Roberts. But before I do, I wanted to take a moment as is our custom and practice to offer a land acknowledgement. And so this evening, we offer a land acknowledgement for Machigan the truest name in Malisee poet Miku Paul's words of the now called city of Portland, Maine, where the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education sits on the campus of the University of Southern Maine. We sit on land that was once water and once part of a water-based ecosystem, which for thousands of years before the French and the English set foot on the neck provided for the indigenous peoples of the Don land the Wabanaki, and those who were here from the beginning in kinship with the land and with the water. And we acknowledge this truth as we acknowledge the contemporary presence of the Abenaki, Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Mi'kmaq, and Maliseet peoples, the Wabanaki Confederacy, and as we acknowledge the devastation of settler colonialism, past and present. Thank you. And now I hope that you will join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Andrea Roberts. Dr. Roberts is Assistant Professor of Urban Planning and Associate Director of the Center for Housing and Urban Development at Texas A&M University and a Center for Heritage Conservation Fellow. She is the founder, as you will learn much more about tonight, of the Texas Freedom Colonies Project, a research and social justice initiative that documents placemaking history and grassroots preservation practices in the African diaspora. And she brings to this scholarship 12 years of experience in community and economic development throughout the United States, including uh, in the cities of Houston and Philadelphia. Both her teaching and her scholarship and her public work and her activism come together to leverage a variety of methodologies that you'll learn more about tonight that make the endangered places of marginalized groups more visible and more relevant to planning scholars, to policymakers, to practitioners. This is gonna bring in action research and digital humanities and ethnography and so much more. She's published widely on African-American placemaking in history and practice, digital engagement, intersectionality, preservation policy, and Black feminist planning history. And she's currently writing a book about Black historic preservation practice. She is a visiting scholar at Yale's Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition, and a 2019 recipient of a National Trust African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund grant. We at the MAP Library are really grateful for Dr. Roberts taking time out of her very busy schedule to be with us this evening. And just on a personal note, as a public historian and a visual historian, I'm compelled to add just how much I admire Dr. Roberts' work, um, how inspiring, how exceedingly relevant I find her, the way she brings together her scholarship, her teaching, her community engagement, and her activism. It's hard to weave those threads sometimes as one individual, um, and how she's really been on this decades-long quest 
to help others really see and understand that which can no longer be seen, which is difficult recovery work. Um, and her work in many ways, as I think you'll see tonight, models the ways in which scholars can work with communities locally to bring forward histories, not just for preservation, but also for con you know, contemporary collective action for social justice and for change. And so welcome, Dr. Roberts. We're so glad you're here. And I happily turn the program over to you. Thank you so much for having me. I uh, appreciate this opportunity to share my work. And I do have to acknowledge that I present today from Bryan College Station, which is the land of the Tonkawa and Santa people. And I also have to acknowledge all of the people who brought me here, uh, all of the enslaved people, all of the migrant workers who made it possible for me to flourish as an educator and a thinker today. And so with that, I will go ahead and share my screen so we can begin the presentation. All right. So I, I want to begin first by saying that um, I, that was a very generous introduction, Libby. I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, but I really uh, like to make it clear that I'm an evolving social justice um, researcher. And as such, I, I hope in presenting this today, not just to relay a truth or an answer, but hopefully during the Q&A that we co-produce some knowledge together in the exchange we have afterwards. So I, I really welcome uh, the engagement with my work um, after the talk. And so, as you know, I wanna talk to you today about the Texas Freedom Colonies Project and mapping the unmapped settlements of Texas. So as I mentioned, the Texas Freedom Colonies Project uh, began in 2014. And it is, as I said, an educational evolving social justice initiative dedicated to supporting just preservation of black settlements, landscapes, heritage, and grassroots preservation practice through research. And so we do three things. We connect and collect. We connect with descendants and we collect their placemaking keeping and, and their place keeping stories and histories. We counter map. We use that information about place uh, and we secure that data. We bring together data from various sources, both crowdsourced and from traditional archival uh, sources to populate the locations in our database and on our interactive public map. And all of this data is collected, not just for the point of just to collect them, but most importantly, to co-create engaged applied research that addresses the needs of freedom colonies, not only as historic entities, but as living, breathing communities with a living, breathing diaspora of stakeholders. And the way we do this, we go about this, the foundation of our work is, is really an engaged research model. Uh, we focus our work on crowdsourcing, securing, spatializing, sharing knowledge, which drives our results, which drives the research agenda, which drives, and so it's an iterative process in which we're hoping that through our engagement, we are constantly able to identify the kinds of research issues and problems that we should be addressing. And when I say issues and problems that we should be addressing, Texas freedom colonies have quite a few challenges. Uh, they are often in locations in which there's high growth and where there is high growth, there's new construction and there's demolition. And so what you see there is a picture of Austin in which these communities um, are often uh, destroyed. And you can see here the number of permits concentrated in the eastern half, which was traditionally where a number of African, where most African American uh, people lived in the city of Austin. Uh, you can see in the map there that where you see the darkest green is where there's the highest concentration of freedom colonies by county. And those stripes are indicating areas that were hit by Hurricane Harvey. 
So you can see very visibly with the hatch marks, FEMA designated and governor designated uh, areas impacted by Harvey and the concentration of freedom colonies. So you can see a very distinct overlap, which is showing you the vulnerability, which is showing you the visibility, but simultaneous invisibility of these places and the issue of access. How are these constituencies and people and places able to access the resources they need to contend with these forces? But first, what are these places? When I say freedom colonies, what am I talking about? It's important to understand that Texas freedom colonies are really a type of free black space. That is all around the world, there have been efforts for African-Americans to seek and create free self-sustaining uh, black communities. However, this particular type of community founded between roughly 1865 and 1930 in Texas is roughly uh, described as uh, places that are usually unplatted, unincorporated, and individually unified by a church, a school, or residence collective belief that a community existed. And it's that residence collective belief part uh, that I've really seized upon um, because there's hardly anything that's as intangible as a collective belief, right? But it is often all that helps us constitute these places which have very few remaining features or uh, what's left, what buildings are left are, are in poor condition. But when we do have buildings, it's usually schools, churches, uh, cemeteries that remain in these communities. They were started by clusters of landowners who came together to intentionally create these places mostly in rural areas, but not exclusively. But the strategy was always to locate places of safety. So we had numbers and safety, but we also had to access and develop on land that maybe wasn't as appealing to whites. And so as a result, we would find ourselves safe, but also in ecologically uh, vulnerable uh, areas, areas that would that would uh, create certain vulnerabilities. So it was in bottomland, coastal areas, often on the edge of the plantations that they fled. So I want to contextualize this though within Black place making as a movement. As I said before, there's been a movement of intentional creation of free Black space or places seeking freedom from anti-Blackness for centuries. In the United States, what I have posted here are some that you are probably familiar with. Fort Mose, Florida, Seneca Village, New York, uh, New Philadelphia, Illinois, Rosewood, Florida, Eatonville, Florida, Nicodemus, Kansas, Allensworth, California. And what unifies most of these, but not all, is written evidence of their existence, records of uh, that showed the way the towns or the cities were platted, and land was intentionally organized. With Texas freedom colonies, these types of communities, while they encompass platted, identified, clear, able to identify places, they also encompass places that are much more difficult to see. And there's a reason for why I keep talking about this issue of visibility. What does it mean not to see? And, and I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit in a moment. But, what happened to freedom colonies? If there were all of these free black communities, what happened to them? Well, the great migration. And what stimulated the great migration was not only seeking economic opportunity, but also fleeing racial violence. So people eventually discovered these accumulation, black people accumulating land in one space. And as a result, uh, you would have efforts to dispossess them of their land. Uh, you would have efforts to run people off of their land uh, with the threat of death. And you also had people seeking political asylum where you see an integration of not just the economic and the violence, but trying to exercise a franchise because that was so threatening and that would, would draw death. And so you have a fleeing of population which brings you a population loss 
you have a decline of the conditions in the community in which it's no longer recognized as a place. You have the incoming infrastructure projects, farm roads, major highways, which eventually um, bifurcated communities, disrupted the landscape circulation patterns that define the ways people moved around and defined their own community, their landmarks. And with a lack of population and long-term uh, residents, you begin to have a decline in building integrity, that is the structure, and then also building integrity in terms of historic preservation, where we talk about this particular structure or building being significant because we can say that this particular building structure land object looks like and encompasses in the body of that structure or object what makes it significant according to a particular point in time, which is difficult to do with a lot of these African-American communities in their declining condition, not because people purposely neglect them, but also because deferred maintenance uh, is costly. And there's also a generational problem where uh, because of redlining and because of discrimination, African-Americans could not access the funds from banks to support uh, the rehabilitation of their homes and to maintain them. And so you have a dissipation of your landscape, your population, the conditions, uh, and this leads to an inevitable invisibility of place. And all that remains is intangible heritage. And then in the present, we also layer on top of all of this, a presumed placelessness of what is left behind, which invites planners, designers uh, to engage in land use planning and zoning that operates as if it is a tabula rasa, nothing was there before or after and we're beginning anew. And the zoning practices uh, reflect that. So all of these have acted to really create the three uh, dimensions uh, of threats uh, to freedom colonies and what makes them difficult to identify, to document and to engage their populations. Their invisibility, low population, declining environments, access, that means their access to expertise and formal official planning and preservations access to the settlements and their stakeholders. It's difficult to target resources and there's no central information that says, oh, this is where and how I locate and serve this population. Cultures are rooted in ephemeral and intangible information, which leaves us as soon as uh, the elders and the keepers of the knowledge uh, leave us. They're susceptible to land loss. I mentioned before um, people being able to come together as landowners and cluster and, and live together. How was that possible? Often through adverse possession. They would show, uh, they would prove that between three and six years they had made good use of the land. That is productive use of the land. They were growing on it. They were selling what they produced. They could declare ownership at the courthouse. Law, very often that did not happen because it was very threatening for an African-American to go to the courthouse and say, hello, I'm an African-American. I owned over a hundred acres of land that often made them a target. So we have a lot of unrecorded land ownership, lack of access to real estate planning, which leaves a lot of land either intestate or distributed among several heirs um, and they lose land through partition sales. So that then dissipates the settlement pattern. So with all of these threats, and I've just given you a wall of doom, I know, uh, I started this research in that wall of doom and then was told about a place where uh, individuals were attempting to both revive and maintain efforts to preserve a place, and that was Shankleville, Texas. So in 2014, I went to Shankleville, Texas because I was invited to attend what's called the Purple Hole Pea Festival. It was the first year that they held this festival to celebrate the Purple Hole Pea, which was a regional uh, food. And it has a whole kind of uh, culture surrounding it, not just the foods that are made, but the way they are sold, sold on the side of the road in little carts. And so this was an effort to really celebrate that culture, but do it in a place that was really not traditionally thought of as a center of Newton County, Texas. 
uh, it was a remote or is a remote uh, African-American community of less than 50 residents. But at this event, I met incredible people who were dedicated to the preservation of this place. So where am I talking about when I say Shankleville? What you're seeing in the map on the screen is an area known to planners as Deep East Texas. The Deep East Texas Council of Governments counts this cluster of counties you see on the right as uh, the Deep East Texas region. It is on the border of Louisiana and the Sabine River. Uh, on the left, you see Jasper and on the right is Newton. They were once one joined county called uh, Jasper, but Shankleville is actually located in Newton County. What makes this area kind of significant, uh, especially to those of you who are interested in sort of the intersection of identity and maps and the law is that this was also a region known as no man's land or the neutral strip. And they still have an annual celebration every year to, to kind of uh, acknowledge that the area along Newton and the Sabine River in Louisiana was a undisputed free territory not held either, not held by the French, the United States or Texas at one time. And so, it's a region in which there was a lot of piracy and there were a lot of stories about enslaved people who ran away, otherwise known as fugitive slaves in this region. And I'll get back to the fugitive slave story in a second. And so what we had was when I got there, you know, the day before the festival is just this, this open space you see here. It's an open space with a historical marker on the right. In the far, in the background, you see a small house and cars. And then on the left, you see an old white church. And along the bottom are really, these are, this is the nature of the landscape that leads me to this community. County roads, very remote and dark. Uh, highways where you see a lot of lumber um, and bridges over large bodies of water, both man-made and natural. So what you see here uh, in this image is Mr. Harold Odom. And so when I attended the festival, I spent some time with Mr. Odom in this spot. And this is where I learned about the origin story of this community. That is, how did this community come about? What's the foundational story of the place? The foundational story of the place is that there were two enslaved Africans in Mississippi. One was sold away to a master in Texas and her name was Winnie Schenkel. Jim Schenkel, though still in Mississippi, once his wife was sold, he decided he was gonna re reunite with her and her three children. So he swam many great rivers until he reached this very spot where there is a spring, where he did a special whistle. He whistled a special whistle that only Winnie could recognize. She came out and found him there and made food available and hid it in this very ice cold spring so that he could survive. Of course, they were discovered. And then master purchased him from the master in Mississippi. They were reunited while still enslaved. After emancipation, they then settled in this area known as Shankleville. And those descendants, Winnie and Jim Shankle, are buried in the cemetery. That's maybe about, um, oh, a quarter of a mile away from this spot. And so we have here a very amazing, captivating um, love story, but we also have something that tells us about the foundations of place making and place community, much in the tradition of maroon communities in many places around the world in which African-Americans seek freedom even while still enslaved, trying to create a piece of a sacred loving world even on the edge of a plantation while enslaved. And so the story wasn't just romantic, however. It was a story that was retold in a number of different settings and had been told not only at that new festival, but at their annual homecoming celebration. And what you see in these images are the fact that the people who are drawn to this small town come from Orange, from Dallas, Beaumont, Houston, and the significance of that is that it could mean a three hour drive, it could mean a six hour drive to get to this community. Uh, and people come here religiously every year, not just descendants of Jim and Winnie Shankle, though a majority of the people are, 
but they're individuals who have possibly married into the families or just are residents of Shankleville. And the individuals standing before that table are all representatives of homecoming committees from other historic black settlements in the region. So what I learned is that there is a network. There is a network in which Shankleville descendants come back and attend the Jamestown settlement homecoming. And the representative uh, is there in the black shirt from that community, from Liberty, uh, from Liberty community is uh, the woman who's standing there. So everyone is supporting each other's events. And it's not just a way to support the events, it's also a time in which they collect funds to sustain their cemeteries. And so you have an intensive cemetery preservation effort that's been happening since the Great Migration because these homecomings were a way for them to assure that, uh, to, to make sure rather that individuals were going to return to these communities because everyone is in big cities, they're in other places. How would you make them return? Well, you had to create events that commemorated the founders, reinforced their identity. And they did this in a, in a, in a number of different ways. This is at the 150th celebration and that woman in the red is evidence of the nature of the Shankleville diaspora and everywhere you can find a descendant of this place. She was a writer for Star Trek, one of the first black women to write science fiction for a television show. And she lives in Australia and had never been to Shankleville in her life and came just to, on their 150th celebration to touch evidence of her origins. And the other individual on the right who's uh, talking in an animated manner, he is from New York City, seeking the same. And so they have all of these rituals and, and uh, uh, celebrations of their culture in which they specifically commemorate Jim and Winnie Shankle and the values and the ethics that associate the success of this couple who created a place. They have a scholarship competition. Uh, they raise money for the scholarship competition at the homecoming and other events. And they also, this, this is an important, this attachment actually yields not only fundraising and money for land stewardship in the cemetery, but also rehabilitation of their historic homestead. This homestead is that little house you saw in the, in the far right in the first picture of Shankleville. And the individuals have come back to actually rehabilitate this house according to uh, the uh, Secretary of the Interior standards for historic structures. As a result, they've been able to not only list this, but also list it to the National Register of Historic Places, but also attain funds to make sure that they are rehabilitating it up to standard. So what we found here is that foundational stories foster place att attachment, encourage participation, and catalyze real pl planning outcomes. So the story is not simply a story of nostalgia, but it's the link that most of us are seeking in our research between theory and action. It's a story that creates a sentiment that fosters a commitment that leads to action. And I want to know, is that the case just in Shankleville or other places? So I was really interested in this uh, issue of storytelling because I saw what stories and memory did in this context. And I wanted to know, okay, so stories are great, but which merit consideration, what's a legitimate form of knowledge and what's relevant to the planning process I began to think that way. And in what ways can these stories be organized, interpreted, and transmitted as a form of knowledge that can tangibly influence planning? So that, that was what I was thinking about. And what it crystallized into, frankly, was really paying mostly attention to local knowledge and examining the, the and comparing and contrasting what the performance theorist uh, Taylor calls the archive and the repertoire embodied uh, scenario-based knowledge and explanation of reality versus what the physical archive tells us is the reality. So I went about learning from the rest of those individuals you saw at the table from other settlements and talking and asking them about their oral traditions and the, studying the content of their oral traditions and then comparing that against cultural resource surveys and the state historical marker files. And I then 
wanted to also, I noticed that performance theory became a way for me to understand what I was witnessing because I saw embodied memory and performance articulating the existence of a place. That is people standing and testifying uh, to the existence of places that have no evidence remaining. And I did all of this through ethnography, archi archival research, interviews. And so when I see, say oral tradition, I'm talking about all these forms of knowledge that tell us uh, about how places are resilient. These stories are visions, they're dreams, proverbs, songs uh, that can tell us so much about the origins and the resilience and the persistence of place. And so all of my questions, and a lot of these inform the questions that are in the Atlas, um, are interview and oral history topics, such as the names that people gave places, multiple names, uh, the residency status of the person I was speaking with, uh, settlement, the actual settlement stories, of, if not just the, the community churches, uh, what were their events and tradition, their preservation activities, and what are the challenges? And the way that I began to do uh, surveying was not just to go and start surveying, but to develop relationships with individuals who were descendants of Shankleville and other settlements and become part of a planning committee for the next year's symposium so that I could hold a, what I call the testimony service where people could share their stories and share what they were doing with their stories. And so we did this at the 2015 Purple Hole Pea Festival. And these are all descendants who come from Houston, the suburb, suburbs of Houston, from Jasper County, Newton County, uh, individuals from Texas Historical Commission who were there uh, to provide information because I didn't wanna just extract information. I wanted people to share their reality, but share it in front of decision makers, such as the Texas Historical Commission. And also there was a funder there from a uh, foundation. So these were all of the ways that I engaged. I started with that event and then that progressed to my moving into other communities, doing the interviews, but also pub comparing public and private archives, being led on walking tours. And throughout the entire time, I was taking a lot of photos and I had a geotag attached to them, meaning the location. So that would allow me to populate these maps. The first map is, what is publicly known about these places. This is what we know to be the reality. On the right is, is what is actually there, according to the tours, the, the stakeholders, the interviews, because I was able to stand in place, take images of places, and also go through private archives and see evidence of place and names of place. And what I found is that what was between me and this knowledge, what's between you and this knowledge is not just memory, but institutional uh, barriers of how these places are perceived. Formal planning uh, sees these as, uh, they're not places unless I know the boundaries, I know the exact population, um, and people are not attached unless I can see that they're full-time residents and that, they had, you know, that they've been there for a substantial period of time. Whereas freedom colonies, um, have much more ephemeral recalled kind of sense of place and boundaries and understandings of importance. And the nature of their place attachment is not based in whether or not someone is a full-time resident. Um, they're diasporic and desert, dispersed. So I had to think of how is it that I'm going to both continue this process, but also build a black digital world of these worlds. Uh, and that came to me because I was thinking, you know, people are everywhere and how can we get them, you know, I can't go one by one to every single place, but I can aggregate information and centralize it and get people to shift away from just a, is there a property there to more of a comprehensive perspective on place through the surveys and address the visibility and the vulnerabilities of these places and create access to the data in a controlled strategic way. And again, it was about how do I expand what happened here through GIS mapping to a larger statewide map. And so we created the Atlas um, first in 2018, and we've been through several versions since then. Uh, and we created the Atlas and Survey, which is really a combination of publicly available data combined with a public list of freedom colonies in the book, Texas Freedom Colonies, so we wanted to verify that those list of names uh, existed, were real, 
um, had any uh, reinforcement from black voices, for example. And we compared that against not just ethnographic data I collected, but all of these traditional ways that we define that a place exists, along with information like that funeral program uh, that would tell you all types of information about a place. And we invited people to put that in surveys. So we have an online survey tab and a spot where you can actually place the location and say, this is where the last remaining church, this is where the school is, this is the name of it. And so that's what we've been doing since 2018 um, in trial and error, frankly, using just one survey, then making a longer one, then making a shorter one. And this is co-created with one of my former students, um, MJ uh, Biazar, using Esri Story Map and Google 123 surveys. And so we build on public data by crowdsourcing. So rather than start and saying, here's a blank map, bring your information, we said, here's foundational data, bring your information. And so for every dot you see is a drop box, which tells you all this information about every place. And to some degree, some are filled more than others because we simply have more information about some and less about others. Uh, and our thinking is to aggregate as much as we can, however we can, rather than waiting for the perfection of the completion of one place at a time. So this is the Atlas. Uh, when you go to the Atlas site, uh, this is what you will see, uh, these tabs. And the Atlas tab is where the map is. And this whole diagram is also on the map when you go there and you have instructional material. Uh, you can do a lot of things. You can search with the map. You can add to the map yourself. You can actually add a feature to the map. Uh, you can look at it in this way, or you can look at it through a Google, you know, a ground where you can actually see uh, the actual background streets. You have a choice of, of different backgrounds. And these are the types of things that people have been uploading, pictures, deeds, um, literal typing of stories and programs and telling amazing stories. And, and this is just one of the many stories that uh, we have. Uh, this one is, I'm not gonna read it to you in the interest of time, but what's significant about this story is uh, that she's sharing all of this information, dates, locations, family names, but you don't see uh, a level of confidence in what she's sharing. She says, the community was called Green Chapel and I'm not sure when it started. And then she proceeds to tell you all of this information about the schools and everything else and about uh, what families did to subsist on the land and changes in, in, po in population. And what I really love is that she tells the embodied experience of the land. And it is a story of black joy, which we don't often map. We map often black destruction <laughs> and map black decline and disappearance. And so she's repopulating the map with the humanity of black settlements. Uh, talking about how she enjoyed walking through the woods and fishing without worrying about being kidnapped uh, and what she ate and saying that she just enjoyed things from the land and getting together with family. So you have a very uh, a sincere rootedness here. And so what, am I, what have I learned so far with, from doing this map? We started with 357 blue dots. And the reason why they're different colors is that the colors differentiate the source of the information. So right now we have 357 blue dots. 10 of our overall list have, are ready to be turned blue and added to make that 367. Uh, we have a total of 664 place names up from 557, the total. And we have 45 of those that are introduced by Atlas users that were not even on our original list of names. So what that proves is that we are adding to the body of knowledge and changing the nature of the body of knowledge through the crowdsourcing process. And we have 90 place narratives or entries that have been uploaded. There's 114 total, but 90 of them have clear identifiable narratives. What's the impact? What's the point? Uh, we have seen other people use our model. It's been used to develop a map on um, the presence of lynching in Texas, 
Uh, it's been referenced in historical marker and national register designations and applications. Uh, the Council of Texas Archaeologists has adopted it in its desktop review of sites. So before um, going out to actually examine or conduct surveys, they were able to, they're able to see there's a possibility of the remnants or, or features in the landscape associated with the black settlement because I see a dot here. So it's giving me a heads up of what I might find. And it has been uh, something that people have incentivized people to document through ordinances. There's an ordinance in Hayes County, a high growth county outside Austin, saying that they are going to incentivize documentation and uh, development of surveys of African-American places in the county, including Freedom Collins. There's a CLG, um, which is just a government program and historic, uh, historic preservation agencies. And we've been working with them on how to change the leadership of preservation organizations at the same time that we tell them how to work with groups to identify and protect historic black resources and freedom colonies. And there's a rural district that was started in Virginia. I got an email a week ago about uh, how they've used some of our uh, methodology for proving up place significance to justify the first rural district for freed people, uh, same as freedom colonies in the state of Virginia. And most recently we published an article on historic black settlements and their cemeteries along Cancer Alley in Louisiana showing the multi-hazard risk and exposure to threats of these cultural resources. So the other lessons, validate and aggressively integrate varied forms of knowledge into your work. Appreciate it, honor it. Um, integrate it into your work as valid knowledge. I've also found that digital engagement makes systemic issues visible. Uh, this was a hybrid event where I had uh, 25 descendants come to uh, the campus and work with our students to tell us what's wrong with the Atlas and to analyze it. And they not only said, oh, we're kind of, this is clunky, this is, you know, not used to the computer, this, that, and the other, but they also said, you know, we just fundamentally need better rural broadband access. So we have these, you know, deep planning issues that pop up. And it also drives the way we go about doing what we do and why we do what we do. During COVID, we've been doing new media heritage curation. We've been doing participatory, we're working on a participatory planning um, uh, registry so that you find a cemetery, you register a cemetery, you get information on what to do about what you found. Uh, we've, I've been integrating this into all of my classes and I've been seeking out um, new layers. We have a layer of all the projects, which you see here are the Texas Department of Transportation projects overlaid with freedom colonies so that if you're a descendant, you can readily see what's coming at you. And it doesn't just say there's a project, it says here's the name of it and here's where you can find out more so that you can actually participate in that process because often they only engage full-time residents and landowners and miss other stakeholders. So this is a dimension of our work that we're building upon. We have not perfected it yet, but we're starting to work with it. And we found that it's been able to increase um, the uh, increased communication pathways, right? To these planning processes where we're linking the existence of these places defined by a counter narrative and counter mapping them to make them visible to these policy making processes. Um, it's made people invest both on and offline. What we should be doing is investing more in both on and offline consultation and engagement. And finally, um, we have to be proactive about inevitable clashes between the rush to build and to grow that we have and preservation. And part of that is making sure that we're creatively and efficiently and transparently engaging all of the stakeholders of places of significance, including freedom colonies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. There's a lot to, to digest there and we definitely invite folks to um, enter your Q&A right into that button at the bottom of the screen and we will, um, and we will get going. My colleague, um, Paula Gersten Blatt, is going to moderate the questions as she comes in, as they come in, um, and also ask some of her own 
And I will just say, Andrea, we have a, a definition request before Paula gets started. I see. If you don't mind defining countermapping. Not at all. Yeah, totally fine. Um, that's a very good question. So understand that there are maps that we use every day that we determine to be valid guides as to where we go and what is the reality. So most obviously a Google map, right? <laughs> if you're gonna say, uh, meet me at this restaurant post COVID, you will say, okay, go to Google and put in this name. Uh, Texas or in any state's Department of Transportation maps, flood maps, uh, land surveys, these are maps. Counter maps, are efforts to visualize and to make, make um, part of the map people and places that weren't normally there, or they existed, but they were not defined as places worthy of being identified as places on that map. So the act of counter mapping is identifying these communities and places or objects and determining the way that you could get them on the map. So some people use ArcGIS, which is a software. If you have an address of a place, then you are able to map it. And to map it means that you're able to place it into the software and it will populate a, a dot on a map in the geographical location, a latitude lo longitude location. And by doing so, the map that I'm creating is not the map that everybody in the world is using. I, that is a counter to the map that says that there aren't necessarily hundreds of black places. Uh, there's the reality of the current map people use. It says the reality is that a place is not a place unless I see this many people, um, that they've been on the census consistently uh, for this period of time and all of these others. So counter mapping is the act of recording the evidence of place and turning it into uh, a point on a map that you create. And there's a lot of other ways, there's cognitive mapping, which I did through Turing and all these other ways to do it. That's the most direct um, description of counter mapping in terms of what we do. Well, it looks like we have um, another question come up, which is how did you uh, geotag pictures? Sure, I used my phone. I did my entire dissertation and I, I say it this way <laughs> because uh, Dr. Kirsten Blatt here was there the whole time uh, and knows what it is to uh, conduct research on a shoestring. And I conducted my research with my car, my phone and a $50 handheld recorder. The phone, when you take a photo, you can turn this feature on and off, mind you. I kept mine on and it gave me a geographic location. So if I'm in Shankleville and I take a photo, I have, here's photo of Shankleville. It has a geo tag. When I upload it, that tag, you can see the latitude longitude, and then you can upload that to the ArcGIS platform. So everything has a geo tag, everything has a geo tag. Whether you know it or not, <laughs> you are being tracked and tagged um, everywhere you carry your phone. And so that was the way that I was able to geotag. It just simply means I identified the geographical tag to the location through the photo. So I have a question. Sure. Um, like you say, I was there with I wasn't there with you on your project, but I was in Texas doing related work and uh, in, in a black community um, in rural Texas. Um, one of the things that uh, just, you know, it didn't surprise me, but it, the vividness of the memories of the space of places that no longer exist, of how people could describe over and over those porch stories of Stanton's grocery store and the Black Hotel. And so uh, all these, these this how space um, is imagined and remembered, right, in memory. And so um, with all the talk about monuments, I mean, the work that you're doing is so amazing because you're collecting like mass narratives, right, in, in sort of 
counter narratives yeah. or counter mapping. I'm interested in um, how those spaces that no longer exist, that you're doing such an amazing job of digitally collecting, mm -hmm. how those narratives could be constructed and remembered in actual physical space, um, given this so now I'm thinking of like counter monuments, right? Right. Um, and I right. know you're doing some work on monuments with the Mellon yes. Foundation. So I'm interested in how we take those vivid memories. And like you say, there's uh, some erasure that, that's, that, that could potentially happen. And think about this in a new way in those actual physical spaces of markers and monuments from maybe a counter mon monument perspective. Mm. So what I think most about are legal tools, which are not as fun and cool and artistic, uh, but important, right? Um, and so more than I think about how do we get many more markers? How do we get many more national register listings? Um, there are certain benefits to doing that and acknowledgement or rather recognition is a dimension of preservation practice and it matters and it's good. <laughs> That's a fact. Uh, however, uh, what I think about more than I think about how do we put something in the ground that marks that this existed is I think about how do we substantially protect the right to remain, to visit, to have autonomy, to do something about that place as a stakeholder. And there are existing tools to do that. But my thinking behind the Atlas is, is really an organizing tool to say, you know, imagine there's a class action suit and that there is reparative work to be done around the taking of land and the destruction of African-American communities exposed to environmental injustice. And that there is a fundamental disconnection and, uh, and ignoring of these communities during disaster recovery. And we could say, blanketly, okay, well, why don't you just say all black people? Well, why don't we say all freedom colonies? And the reason why I say that is there's a, there's a differentiated invisibility associated with these places. And so I look at how are we creating more historic wow. districts, which, you know, people complain and say, oh, historic districts, all they do is perpetuate gentrification and they're evil and they're bad. Well, if only white rich people keep making historic districts, what do you think is gonna happen? Meaning it's a tool and what it affords you is resistance against demolitions, more so than a national register district. But we don't have a local consciousness of the power that we have to protect. And so I'm very fixated in my mapping um, with visualizing risk and thinking about targeted protection. Now, to get to your, to your direct question was about monuments. I also think about revising monuments. I'm very, very, my thinking about it, it is, is both about, we need some recognition that makes people see in real time physically, this is a black place or it was a black place or there's black stakeholders. So I'm, I'm with you on that. And we're actually thinking about that with Mellon right now. Uh, haven't really, you know, cause I'm really fixated on the protection, right? Um, but I'm also thinking about um, the ways in which these places are, uh, don't even show up in historical markers that were written 50, 40 years ago. And we have markers out there and they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> they either omit or they're just really wrong or really offensive. And so to me, there's like this whole um, corrective measures to be doing, which can be an artistic endeavor, right? Of, of how you, um, for example, you know, do a relief or a scraping of, you know, a, a sheet of paper over um, a headstone, you could do that over markers and post them and, and actually, you know, start to highlight or black out what the marker is really saying. So there's, a, here we are brainstorming a project. And so, <laughs> <I'm getting laughs> but, but, <laughs> but, but there's some corrective work or, and not just to go and say secretly I'm correcting, but let's visibly publicly correct together. 
is is kind of what I'm excited about about doing next. Yeah, I'm I'm excited too. Just the, the wheels are turning. In the meantime, David had David Nutty has a question. Are Freedom Colonies located throughout the South? If so, is there an estimate of how many there may be? Oh gosh. Um, so the guesstimate is um, around how many. Most people say I'm only talking about historic black towns. Like there's uh, people working in North Carolina and they use the language of town, 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 town. And so when you use that language, then people say there were 1,500 black towns across the United States at any given time, which is a lot. If we're talking about settlements and places as having the same respect as towns, right? Then, it, so we have a more expansive definition of place, of black places that transcend town, right? Then we have no idea. And we need to do what I'm doing all over the United States. <laughs> and Texas is a test run of how we might do that. Uh, that's, that's part of what we need to do is extrapolate this to other context. And that's part of what we started doing in Louisiana with this project with one of my students who's focusing in on black cemeteries. So how does crowdsourcing, how, what kind of materials does she have to crowdsource and organize online to figure out who's the, in the cemetery, what the name of it is? Um, a lot of the same type of methodological work she's applying to Louisiana. Had a big discussion right before I came on today with folks from Louisiana who were like, I need help in Louisiana. We need it along Cancer Alley. There's this environmental justice thing here and people are not seeing it. They're seeing them as communities. I say there's one or two people who got sick over there. What's the difference when you say there's one or two, there's, there's people who are getting sick in Houston? Well, you're like, wait, it's, something's happening in a city. Sick people are getting sick in Portland. Well, in Portland, it's a city, it matters. And so it's a lot different than saying, you know, oh, it's those little people over there. So, uh, you know, we're, I think uh, that's, uh, I don't know if I'm getting at the core of the question though, but that's, that's where we're going with it. If you're talking about like, what are the numbers and what's the breadth and the width of it? You know, um, I happen to start in those two counties, but my point of doing a map is to show you they're everywhere. There are 16 in Harris County, which is the county that holds Houston, okay? There are the same number in uh, Travis County, which holds Austin. So we have to shift our geography around, okay, how many are in this city to all of the places in which we have all types of scale of development in which we have destroyed these places. There's suburbs on top of these places, exurban retreats, you know, it's rural gentrification on a massive scale is destroying these places and nobody's paying attention to that. And I think your expanded definition or looking at the varying definitions like town, colonies, these spaces is really, really important because I think that's what taps into people beginning to think of their space and place and memory is having a, and I remember your coffee talk and really starting to think differently, oh, this town isn't a black town, but then thinking of that protected space and the, the existence of those communities, which I think broadens the, the you know, broadens the concept around yes. it. Yes, that's a really important point because part of, if, if I'm, you know, ironically, Texas freedom colonies, but if we're decolonizing the idea of what a place is and how a place matters, we have to think of how we include more rather than exclude. We have a preservation system based solely on scarcity and rarity. And so I know people are kind of probably like, what? well, what else would it be? <laughs> well, why are we not thinking more expansively about how we include and validate more black places rather than, well, that's not a town. It doesn't have an official map. Who's the mayor? I can't see those things. Oh, but I can see it in that one. So that one matters. And so part of this process I'm hoping is about this fundamental question of value and legitimacy of place. Yeah. 
in doing this. That, that equity issue is really important. Yes. And, and segues well to Ron's question, which is you've shown us examples of communities in rural areas. Have you documented any communities now lost because they have been overrun by urban growth and expansion as the Houston metro area? Perfect. Yes, absolutely. My hometown. Um, so I'm from the Houston area and I started off doing uh, this work because um, I have rootedness in Houston's third and fourth wards and an area called Piney Point and also Riceville. And then other family in Fort Bend County, which is sort of bedroom community of Houston. And we have roots in that county back to its origins before Texas became a republic, let alone a state. And I didn't find out any of this information until, you know, well into my adulthood. I don't want to tell my age. And so, <laughs> well, well into my adulthood. And that was really shocking to me that I, I was like, this is all really significant. And it's not just significant to me, like this is all amazing that I have this rootedness in these historic black places. Oh my God. And they are historic, even though nobody around here, I don't know what a freedom colony is. I just call it. Ricefield or black side of town or whatever. And so I initially started my exploration in Houston and suburban areas. And that was what caused me to drop everything and leave Houston government and go back to grad school. Because <laughs> I had a you know, nice trajectory like doo -doo 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 -doo. and um, I was much more interested in what is what is the problem with the way planning looks at black places and has this language of like over concentration of black people you know just even the language is is this blaming kind of you know language and negativity and so that i was thinking about all that in an urban and suburban con uh, con and context and my first papers were about black placemaking that was in that region. And it's a, uh, a paper called, um, what is that paper? Farmers Improvement Society and the Women's Barnyard Auxiliary, which is about black placemaking, not only in places that are rural, but formerly rural areas. My grandmother, Riceville is in Houston. And I spent my summers there. Uh, the documentation's right here. And it's also in the Atlas and it's in my body. It's the way I cook, <laughs> it's, you know. It's a, um, not that disconnected, but in terms of documenting, yes, you take a look at the Atlas, you go and you blow up the Houston area, the closer you get in, the more individual dots you will see of drop boxes with stories and images of place in the greater Houston area. And one last thing about that, while I was a grad student, I worked with a woman named Jenny Minner and uh, Dr. Minner is at Cornell University. And when I started my program, I was working with her on something called the Austin Historical Wiki, and which inspired in part some of what I'm doing with the Atlas, except hers was completely architectural based. It was how do we get a cheap way for more people to start districts by having an architectural survey that anybody could use with some training and some workshops and learning the terminology, but it meant the difference between hiring someone to do the survey of your neighborhood for 50 to $100,000 and getting volunteers together and doing it. You see how that equity issue <laughs> takes a wall down? So it's really groundbreaking work, except when I talk to people, or no, and not except, when I talk to people, they also added, I kind of want to know about stuff that's not here anymore. I want a place to put my stories about the ice cream shops and all the businesses that used to be down here. And I, I want to say stuff about that. And I, I don't I don't know if I care about the roof pitch. And, you know, I don't know that I, I care about, you know, uh, the materials and whether or not that transom should be closed or open and sealed up or not, or how long it was there and what year it was put in. And is that a Queen Anne or not? Those questions weren't driving the interests of many African-Americans that I was trying to engage. And so that also kind of influenced my work, but you know, to answer your question, yes, I was walking up and down the street in black and brown communities with an iPad, recording the changes in the landscape I was seeing over time of different ethnic groups and African-Americans coming in and out of the neighborhood seeing, 
okay, that's a Queen Anne, but that porch was put in 1920, or this gate was in 1930 by Latinos. And recording all of that on that architectural scale, which is fascinating, awesome, and important. Um, but then I just came back from it. I was like, I need people to really see the nature of our footprint on this, on this state. <laughs> and so that made me kind of back up and think about how can we do this county by county? Um, yeah, so that's, that's the answer. Uh, Ashley has a question. Oh no, Isabel. She uh, said, can you talk more about some of the best ways lessons learned mm. while reaching out to historically yes. underrepresented communities when you're trying to work to preserve their history? So one of the, it's very interesting you say that. I think I, I deleted one of the slides about this very issue, but I'm happy to talk about it. And it's about re reflexivity and cultural humility. These are the two principles of engaging in research in this context that I think are significant. Reflexivity is about understanding that by virtue of your own positionality and entering a research context, you are changing the research context. What that means is that you are also changing the way people may react to you. Your, your presence may also uh, disturb dynamics in that community. And it's also about recognizing that you are extracting and taking something of value. And there's a principle of reciprocity that you should be cognizant of. And reciprocity can happen in all types of forms. It could come in literal, oh, well, you're on the research project and you're learning to do oral history. Why don't I pay you? Why don't I write you into the grant rather than just saying, you should be really grateful to be part of my project because you get recorded. Uh, so reflexivity says I'm aware of the power I hold here and a desire to share the power here comes out of cultural humility. Instead of looking at communities with sort of a God's eye view of like, this is what's happening. Let me help you make sense of your reality. It's, I, I see you've made sense of your reality. What is it telling you you need? And, and what are the kind of big questions that maybe we could partner with you in answering to get you where you wanna go? And that's a very different perspective. And you know, it's very hard to continue that in doing the work that I'm doing. It's digital, it's online, especially now because of COVID. But usually we go out, we demonstrate the Atlas, we sit with people and teach them how to use it and get them online, help them scan pictures and put them in. So it's an interactive, it is, you know, tactile <laughs> with people. Um, but when it's digital, it really feels like, give me your stuff, give it to me, <laughs> you know? And so it's been really important to, with, uh, you mentioned the new Facebook live show we do to have times when we foreground that voice of the descendant by saying, here's our show and here's the majority of the show in which we're showcasing someone who works with or is a descendant so that we have that connection and that reciprocity that we're, okay, we got this platform, what do we do with it? Well, we make sure the people who made it possible in the first place actually get to use it. So these are the kind of the principles, the reciprocity, the cultural humility, um, and yeah, and the reflexivity during research. I mean, and I say cultural humility very deliberately. Uh, it's a very important concept. A lot of people talk about cultural competency. Problem with that is you cannot become competent in me. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, you are not about to become, oh, I have figured Andrea out. I have figured out Paul and I've figured out Libby. And so you see that, you know, that is not the intention, but there's an arrogance and like, I can become competent. Oh, I know lots of those people. I have worked with them and I get them. And so humility says I come in knowing I don't know and that I will never fully know, but we can engage in a production of knowledge together and do something great together. I think those words, reciprocity and co-constructing and doing things together. But I think a, a great piece of what you talk about is we can't take without giving back. And, and, and that's something that is negotiated between 
you know, all the participants and, and that I, I just think it can't be stressed enough. And, and the fact that you're leading your project with that philosophy and teaching your students that which many of us are really trying to put in um, real terms uh, in practice is can't be uh, emphasized enough. So um, I'm going to get to Ashley's question. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I'm wondering how much information you were able to gather from local cemeteries. Are they still in existence in these freedom colonies? What condition are they in? Is there a local community movement to maintain and preserve them? Thanks. I'll tell you what we are doing around cemeteries. Uh, we were privileged to receive a small grant um, from the National Trust, and that was that Libby mentioned in the intro. And the purpose of that is to revamp our website to make it more interactive and to include a cemetery registry. Uh, there is a national, there's national legislation that was passed by uh, the House and the Senate, and it, it is exists. It's African burial ground, a uh, national network uh, to document African burial grounds. And so our thinking was, how do we make the atlas available for people to also say, I've not only documented this, but the way I know that this settlement exists is that there's a cemetery. And also to answer some questions that can do two things. They can, or really three, one, just it's there because it may not be registered with state and no one knows it exists. And then two, um, to make sure that we assess what kind of danger it's in. So to have a, a set of assessment questions. And then the most important thing to route people to help. So we're working with Texas Historical Commission actually with their cemetery point person. And we're mapping out in the discussions in a focus group with people who run into these cemetery problems and saying, well, who do you call when you find it? Or do you know how to start a cemetery uh, association? Or where do I go if I wanna find a grant for cleanup? And so there's this whole wall of questions and some people know the answers and some people don't, there's no centralized place to go. And so what we're doing right now is applied research uh, to determine how can our platform on a bigger website enable people to give us that information and in return, learn what they can do to address the circumstance of that cemetery. That funding is to help us develop the plan to figure out how to do that. We're gonna test out some things in the interim, but really there's a whole new platform that we're gonna do to kind of accommodate being able to train people how to gather this knowledge in the field add it in their mobile app, get it up to our website, and then make sure it's securely given to the right agencies and people who can give them money and support. And so there are several emails I get saying, I need help with my cemetery. Give me some money. I need some help with my cemetery. Where do I go? Where do I go? I send them to Texas Historical Commission. The Historical Commission says, I can only do this. I can do that. And they say, well, you ask them. I can't have to tell you how to start one. Yeah, go here, go there. So that's the situation. Um, ironically, in these rural areas is where you have the really disciplined support and maintenance and stewardship of the cemeteries. In the urban areas, high growth, which is where a lot of the study is done, frankly, the Houston Galveston area um, that we're doing, and also in East Texas too, like, you know, it's, it's a major problem. People are building more. Uh, people want bigger drainage pipes. You build more, you need bigger drainage. You need better infrastructure. What are you gonna hit? Um, people were promised that bodies were moved that were never ever moved. Uh, there's roads on top or splitting cemeteries. I mean, it's, it's a major issue, a major national problem. And so our little bit of what we're doing, um, you know, we could one by one, say here we get, went and we cleaned the cemetery, or we helped this one cemetery. And we encourage and we support people who do that. Ours is how do we do some system change about how people can access the help they need 
and get the information they need. That, that's where we're focusing. Um, there's also, at least from what I've seen in my work in Texas, family cemeteries. Yes. And, and there's a cemetery that I know of in Mart that is, um, has people who were born slaves. There's just a bit, there's a lack of bandwidth in the community to really address it. So I think right. looking at the systemic piece is gonna be really important because it depends on a community that they may not have the bandwidth or the capacity to deal with this incredible space that is such a historical marker. So I think that's a really important piece and I'm gonna send the cemetery to your, to your <laughs> website. Um, David Weaver says, well done, very nice presentation. This isn't a question, but Dr. Roberts might be interested to know a common term for her counter mapping is quote, volunteer geographic information, IG, yes. VGI, a, a term Michael Goodchild of UCSB coined in 2007 to describe creating, assembling, and uh, I, I can't see this, I should put my glasses on, right? It's disseminating. Thought. Uh, I'm getting old. I don't want to say my age either. <laughs> Geographic data provided voluntary yeah. By individuals. Yeah. So um, I have at least, I think, three papers that specifically frame the work that way. Some of the work that I did with Jenny Minner and Michael Holleran and Josh Conrad. And I encourage people to read those. One of the uh, articles is A Smart City uh, Remembers Its Past. And it talks about our uh, gathering. Um, that uh, volunteer geographic information. Um, and counter mapping, um, I think is a larger umbrella term, um, frankly, because as much as we are using the Atlas, sometimes people are sending us scanned paper surveys. Some people, there's a number of different ways people are giving us this volunteer geographic information. And so um, the other thing I would say is I'm very proud of those articles, <laughs> They're heavily cited, people like them. Um, but I also have found that people are empowered by counter mapping. They're like, oh, I'm countering something. I'm giving, you know, I'm, I'm doing something rather than let me volunteer this to you, this scientific inquiry process. And so it's languaging, but it can also matter in your engagement process, right? And so even when we were doing that and publishing in e-planning journals and all of that, um, we wouldn't tell people, thank you for your volunteer geographic information. Um, even though that's, you know, we publish on that and people cite that all the time. So I have a kind you. of a related question, Andrea, yes. thank you. Um, as we get ready to wrap up in, you know, you mentioned both the public archive and the private archive. And I was wondering if in, conclusion, you could talk a little bit about how important um, private archives are to the work that you're doing, particularly in the Black community and particularly in, in holding those things close, right? It's, yeah. it, it's hard. I mean, it, to be a researcher who has access to the private archive is all about that relationship building. Yes, and that is frankly, we find ourselves at a crossroads with the project right now. So as much as I'm very proud of it, I'm proud of my researchers, my research team of Skylar and, and Jennifer and Valentina and Kendall and Natalie, um, I'm very, very proud of them, but we have a lot of work to do. And that work, that next frontier is the ethics of conservation and the power that we now hold that we have this information in these pictures. So we do creative commons licenses. We're very transparent about use and, and people's ability to you know, take their information back if they don't want to. But this issue of power is, is really the next thing that we're trying to engage with the different ways that we will create new levels of access, access for some and not for others. Um, the more that we gain, the more that there's interaction, then there's more that there's more living people with living interest. And so we have to act differently. So that, that's kind of what we're fixated on with this issue of the responsibility of the archive. Um, there's a lot of community-based archives. The other thing that we're interested in is how we do outreach that supports people, not all, only in saying, give it to me so we keep it safe. Actually, that's not always the point. The point is, 
How do we help you keep it safe and have a plan for who receives it after you're gone? And that's not always supposed to be a university. Quiet as it's kept, it's not always that. Sometimes it's you're going to pass it to the next generation. And there's certain treatments to those materials and ways that they are to be preserved. Um, and we're we're embarking on now, the next thing is how do we train people to do that as we're asking them to share some of it with us. That's an exciting new frontier for you. And, and it's hard. luckily with that, that's really hard. And there are a lot of people, just get some archivists on board. There's a lot of people yes. who have done community archiving who will bring those boxes and that acid-free paper and yes. come with you um, when we can get out of COVID times and, and yes. be there with people to, to do these things together. A lot of people have done scanathons too and you know yes. helping people digitize and preserve that way for their own families as well. Right. So important because as you know, these people who you're working with, they're the knowledge keepers. Sometimes of their entire extended family might be yep. one person. One person. They remember down to when the time people were born, some of these people, you know. And even before, sometimes. And even before. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Roberts, thank for you. a totally stimulating evening. Thank you, everyone who could join us. Thank you, Paula for helping us moderate and, and being a part of this evening. We are recording, so we will happily share this on all of our Ultra Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education venues. Um, so if you had friends who wanted to come tonight and couldn't, they will be able to see the recording. So have a wonderful evening, everyone, and we will bid you good night. And thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks, Paula. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.